Hi guys, in this video we are going to discuss listeriosis. Listeriosis is the condition that a person gets when they consume the organism Listeria monocytogenes. Um, there are actually 19 different species in the genus Listeria, but Listeria monocytogenes is really the only one that is kind of medically important. Um, and the reason it's medically important is that it's actually really well distributed in animals and in food and even on our own skin. So this means that there's high expose, exposure risk for us. The good thing is that it's a fairly rare cause of disease. When it causes disease, it tends to be a sporadic cause of disease where you have these focal epidemics that are typically linked to contaminated food. And when you think about that, that actually makes it a fairly important um, organism. Approximately 48 million or one in six people each year will c consume something that leads to foodborne illness. Yeah, hi, Allie. How are you doing? And when somebody, you know, experiences foodborne illness, most of the time it's a um, self-resolving, you know, very um, protracted course of gastroenteritis. They recuperate and all is well. But unfortunately, in some cases, when a patient consumes Listeria monocytogenes, the outcome is something much more severe, meningitis. And this can be deadly, particularly in certain populations. And the people we worry about most are pregnant women and their um, infants, as well as the elderly or very young and the immunocompromised population. So we're going to talk about Listeria monocytogenes kind of in this context and how we've changed kind of our nutrition guidelines for people as a result of specific outbreaks of this organism. Okay, first let's just talk about the organism. It's a gram-positive bacillus, okay? So that's what I'm showing here. But they're actually very small bacilli. Um, so if you look at this one over here, this looks very similar to another organism that causes meningitis, and that organism is Streptococcus pneumoniae. It's kind of the most common cause of meningitis in adults. And Listeria monocytogenes can cause meningitis in the same population. And when we think about Strep pneumo, that's a gram-positive diplococci, but it's kind of a lancet-shaped gram-positive diplococci plecoxi, so it's a little bit elongated. So just on gram stain, you can't really tell for certain, are you dealing with strep pneumo or Listeria monocytogenes? Because Listeria is not a nice elongated rod, and sometimes they can couple up. The other thing that makes it somewhat hard here is that it's beta hemolytic, like some of our other organisms, like Staph aureus and Streptococcus pyogenes, right? But then it also is camp factor positive. We talked about camp factor with the organism GBS or group B strep, which is um, Streptococcus agalactiae. Streptococcus agalactiae, agalactiae, when streaked at a 90 degree angle from Staphylococcus aureus, leads to an enhanced zone of hemolysis that looks like this kind of arrowhead shape, okay? That indicates that it has camp factor. Camp factor is not the same thing as cyclic AMP. It's actually named after the people who identified it. Instead, what we have with Listeria monocytogenes is we do still have this enhanced zone of hemolysis where Listeria meets Staphylococcus aureus, but it's a little bit less than we see when we have group B strep meet Staph aureus. So it still has it, but it's milder. We do see hemolysis, but again, it's narrow. It's not very robust. So, you know, just kind of slight differences. The one way you could kind of tell the difference here, because remember, group B strep is also a major cause of meningitis. In this case, it's a cause of meningitis in infants, which is another group that we specifically worry about with Listeria monocytogenes. So we have strep pneumo that we worry about in adults, and we have GBS that we worry about neonates, and it's kind of hard from what we have here, gram-positive staining and camp test um, biochemistry to tell the difference between Listeria monocytogenes and these two other causes of meningitis. But what we do have is this, Listeria monocytogenes is normally catalase positive, and that's actually really helpful, right? Because all of the streptococci are catalase negative. So Listeria monocytogenes being catalase positive is actually really helpful for an identifying feature. The other thing is Listeria monocytogenes is modal and it tends to actually move in kind of this 
umbrella fashion where it just kind of like swoops around it makes like these little circles and if you click this link you'll be able to see a video showing its motility yeah. so why it's so important that you be able to differentiate strep pneumo and gbs from listeria monocytogenes actually gets at treatment the antibiotics that you would give a patient that you suspected had um, bacterial meningitis would be things like ceftriaxone plus vancomycin. This is pretty much a winning combination that's going to take care of most of the organisms that cause bacterial meningitis. The one they don't cover, listeria. For listeria, you're going to need to add in ampicillin and gentamicin. So if you think listeria could be on your list of organisms because your patient is a neonate or your patient is significantly older or your patient has been eating a whole bunch of soft cheese during a listeria outbreak it that's when it matters to make sure that you're providing coverage because your normal empiric coverage won't do it and that also explains why we need to be able to tell the difference either morphologically or biochemically from these two other causes of meningitis okay so we've already talked about this a little bit and we're going to talk about it even more but we need to think about how we get this and why it affects where we are able to avoid it. It's really widely distributed in all sorts of food and animals. Um, and when we get it is normally in contaminated food. What I'm talking about with contaminated food, there's a couple hot buttons. Um, deli meats, which let me tell you as a Long Island girl, this one was a hard one for me when I was pregnant. Um, hot dogs, those have often been linked to it. Soft cheeses. Um, pretty much when you're pregnant, they tell you to avoid things like delis, soft cheeses, um, fresh fruit has been linked to it before, specifically cantaloupes, um, and actually last year there was um, an issue with lettuce. So they kind of limit what you can eat. Um, when I want, when I went back to New York while I was pregnant for my baby shower, all I wanted was a good deli sandwich from my favorite deli in Brightwaters. Um, and it was really, really, um, hard to avoid that because, you know, when you're pregnant, you also want a lot of different foods. But the problem is that if you get it, um, it can actually be very dangerous to you while you're pregnant and also especially dangerous to your unborn child. So it is fairly rare, but when it happens, because the organism has this neurotropism, it actually makes it the number one cause of, commu of community-acquired meningitis. Um, and so, like I said, it's a particular concern for pregnant women and their unborn children, but it's also a particular concern for patients on glucocorticoids, which is actually a fairly large percentage um, overall of our population. There's lots of people who take steroids for all sorts of different reasons, and this actually makes them much more susceptible to developing meningitis as a result of consuming um, listeria. The other thing that I'll say is that it's also often present on our skin, and that actually makes it somewhat um, interesting when we think about how we would go about diagnosing listeria. So when you're worried about meningitis, one of the things you're going to do is a lumbar puncture. So to do a lumbar puncture, I'll let you know one of your anatomy instructors or practitioner instructors explain this better, but essentially you're inserting a needle into the spinal column, which means you have to go through the skin. If you have not adequately cleaned the skin, you might show up with some gram positive rods in your CSF. And that is going to make the lab concerned that we have listeria. So you want to make sure that the skin is properly cleaned because if we find these gram positive rods, we want to know that they're actually for real um, and take them seriously. Um, because obviously not treating them or not treating them appropriately would be significantly dangerous. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how listeria replicates. So listeria is normally aerobic, but it is also a facultative anaerobe. And one of the reasons that it's able to survive in, as a facultative anaerobe is that it's able to survive within cells. So there are actually several steps in the life cycle of listeria monocytogenes that take place within the human cell. Um, and thanks to its ability to over to um, live there, it's also able to kind of hijack all of the actin in our cells to allow it to move cell to cell without ever actually entering the extracellular space anymore. Um, so it's actually a pretty sneaky bug. Um, so first off, we ingest it. So when you ingest it, this tells you that it's actually able to survive the very low pH of your gastrointestinal tract and survive digestion. 
and then is going to adhere to host cells via the interaction of proteins on the surface of the bacteria with the glycoprotein receptors on the host cell. And that's going to lead to its internalization into the phagolysosome. Now, in most cases, something gets put into the phagolysosome and oxidative burst happens and that's the end of the story, the organism dies. But in this case, the phagolysosome is actually helping Listeria find its end location that it wants to be at. So the low pH of the phagolysosome activates two Listeria proteins, um, Listeria lysin O and um, Listeria lysin C, okay? Um, these are phospholipase C enzymes, which essentially allow Listeria to break out of the phagolysosome and into the cytosol. So it leaves and it's actually able to just survive in the cytosol for kind of a prolonged period of time, replicating very happy in its new home. So the bacteria replicate in the cytosol and then they produce this protein. The protein is known as ACT A and it essentially takes control of actin assembly. And what it does then is build a rocket. That's right, it creates an actin rocket. And if you click this link, you'll be able to see some really cool images from the Theriot lab um, that essentially show that this um, organism can then kind of propel its way around the cell. And what it does is eventually it propels itself into the cell wall and kind of forces its way into a neighboring epithelial cell such that it's able to kind of create its own double membraned vacuole. And once inside the vacuole, the whole process takes over again. Um, so this is actually a very, very cool process. Um, and it enables it to kind of avoid humoral immunity completely. And that's why patients who are lacking cell mediated immunity are really in big trouble when they have um, listeriosis because once it goes internal it doesn't ever have to leave again it kind of acts like a virus in that way just it does all of its own replication because it can replicate in ma in macrophages after passing through intestinal lining it carries the bacteria kind of anywhere in monocytes and all sorts of places so it goes to the liver and the spleen and once it's in the liver and the spleen we're going to see disseminated disease and that's going to lead to sepsis or eventually even reach the brain causing meningitis it also is able to go across the placenta so the baby can be infected in utero Okay, so now we're going to talk about the clinical diseases associated with listeria monocytogenes. In healthy adults, this is largely not even a concern. They're often going to be asymptomatic, maybe have some mild flu-like symptoms consisting of an acute self-limited gastroenteritis that lasts about two days and then goes away. In elderly patients, the course can be much more severe, which makes sense because they're lacking some of our intrinsic cell-mediated immunity um, that we rely on to combat listeria. Now, when we talk about listeriosis, there's really only a couple of groups that we're concerned about, babies and adults with poor cell-mediated immunity. We're gonna start with babies. So in the neonate, there are two forms of disease. Early onset, which refers to transmission in utero, i.e. mom had it, got sick, it transferred across the placenta and infected the baby. And late onset, which refers to transmission at or soon after birth. So when the baby is still a little, little bitty. So in early onset, we can see a couple of different things. One, we can see spontaneous abortion, stillbirth, or premature birth. Um, you can also see granulomatosis infantiseptica, which is a severe form of early onset listeriosis, which is kind of characterized by the formation of abscesses and granulomas. Late onset is characterized by meningitis and meningoencephalitis with septicemia. The clinical signs and symptoms are really not unique from other organisms that cause meningitis in brand new babies. So that's why we have to be really careful about excluding GBS, right? Because the same antibiotics won't work and they, the same population of patients is at risk for both. The other person we have to worry about in this whole thing is mom. So pregnant women are 20 times more susceptible to Listeria monocytogenes than their peers. Um, most infections occur during the third trimester when cellular immunity is most impaired. And infected women will typically develop kind of that nonspecific flu-like symptom, which resolves without treatment. 
And that's what's concerning, right? Because if mom was really sick and went to the doctor, she would receive antibiotics and then hopefully baby would receive some antibiotics. But if she just kind of has a bad stomach flu for a day or two, stays home, gets up and goes on with life, she may not be getting the care that she needs for her infant. Um, the other group we worry about are adults with poor cell mediated immunity. So in addition to the mother, um, we also worry about people with weakened immune systems and adults 65 or older. Um, in these populations, it's much more likely to cause meningitis. So clinical signs and symptoms, again, not going to be specific. So it should be suspected in patients who are taking glucocorticoids, patients with organ transplants, cancer, HIV, pregnant women, um, and then also, as I said, um, elderly patients. Um, it has a 20 to 50% mortality rate. And even if you do survive, there's significant neurologic sequelae always associated with bacterial meningitis. So when we think about it, we need to think about the foods that we want to avoid, right? So um, soft cheeses I mentioned, which let me tell you, skipping that soft buffalo mozzarella that you see um, in the water on the deli counter, oh, so good. But you can't, can't have that when you have this weakened immune system, when you're pregnant, things like that. Raw sprouts, raw unpasteurized milk, yes, that is a thing that people are interested in drinking, but hopefully not when they are pregnant or um, taking glucocorticoids or over a certain age. And then deli meat and hot dogs have often been linked to listeria outbreaks as well. Okay, so how do we diagnose it? Um, you can do gram staining of the CSF and that when you do that will actually kind of be interesting because your patient will be showing symptoms of something going on, meningitis, encephalitis. When you look at the CSF profile, it may almost look like a viral encephalitis because you're likely to see more lymphocytes than PMNs. Why? Because it's intracellular. So because it's intracellular, it's gonna look kind of weird. You'll have some neutrophil, but you'll also have some lymphocytes. Um, so what you're gonna wanna do to make sure you actually do it is look at blood auger. Because while this will show you the CSF profile, partially because there won't be really any organisms. Why? Because the organism is intracellular. So you might see it if you actually looked in the cells, but that's really hard to do. Um, but you can grow it on blood auger and you might wanna put it in the fridge for a day or two. If you put it in the fridge for a day or two, the listeria will grow out and nothing else will. And that'll tell you exactly what you're looking for. Um, but you'll also see a narrow zone of beta hemolysis and you can again do that camp testing. Um, you can grow it on blood auger and then gram stain it um, because then you'll actually see um, the organisms. Okay, how do we treat it and how do we avoid it? Um, avoiding it has actually been our best bet. Um, it's a fairly rare cause of disease, thankfully, but we do see outbreaks in it all the time. What has changed is who we see the outbreaks in. And a lot of this has to do with an outbreak in California in 1985. So in 1985 in LA County, there was an outbreak in soft cheeses. So essentially um, one of the soft cheese um, manufacturers had a contamination with listeriosis. During that time, there were 142 cases, confirmed cases of listeria. 93 cases were women who were pregnant with children. Of those cases, um, of the 142 cases, 28 people died. 18 of them were mothers and other adults. 10 of them were newborns. And there were an additional 20 spontaneous abortions. So this one had a pretty high death toll. And what did it tell us? It told us that we could avoid it. That with some simple dietary changes during this very short period of your life, even if it feels like an eternity when you're going through it, you can actually protect yourself. Um, so we created some guidelines. So pregnant women shouldn't eat things like soft cheeses, deli meats, um, sprouts, smoked fish, anything that has a higher likelihood of being contaminated. The other thing is the CDC has actually changed its reporting timeline. So during 1985, it took 31 days before the first case was reported and linked to and identified as listeria. So it spread and a lot of people died. In 2011, there was another outbreak, so not that long ago, in cantaloupe. 
Um, this time it only took seven days for us to identify and there had only been eight um, cases at that time. Now this one actually wound up being a very high, um, highly fatal um, outbreak. There were 147 cases and 33 people died. So it's still a significant cause of concern, even though we are finding it faster. As I record this video, there actually is an outbreak in four states in the United States. Um, it actually began in Michigan, um, and currently there's only about eight cases. Um, the other thing that I'll say that was different about these, in this one, the median age of the patients and the patients who died was 28. In this outbreak though, the median age was 78. So we've been able to protect um, pregnant women and their children much better um, thanks to some of these dietary guidelines. So for the most part, avoid sp suspicious foods. There's no vaccine for this one. But to treat it, if you suspect your patient has been exposed to listeria or is in one of these cohorts that we worry about, make sure you're adding ampicillin and gentamicin to your empiric treatment guidelines until you have ruled out listeria as a cause of disease. The other thing to keep in mind is that most of the antibiotics that we use are bacteria static for listeria, and that's one of the reasons we may need to change up our protocol.